Welcome to Hard Talk from Harare, the Zimbabwean capital, with me, Stephen Sacker. For the past 35 years, this place has been dominated by one man, Robert Mugabe, hero of the liberation struggle, all-powerful president, and for some in the West, a pariah. He is now 91, and clearly he cannot go on forever. But what comes next? Well, my guest today is the influential, outspoken information minister here, Jonathan Moyo. Can there be a peaceful transition in Zimbabwe? Jonathan Moyo, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Would you agree with the proposition that Zimbabwe is in desperate need of change? Well, it depends on what you mean by change. Uh, we are a country which is a product of uh, revolutionary change, and therefore uh, revolution has always been part of our project. And uh, we are still implementing the agenda of our revolution. It's hard to embrace the notion of Zimbabwe changing very much when you have a president who has ruled this country for three and a half decades and who is now aged 91. He is the one who led the independence struggle. He led the revolution and as I just said, the agenda of the revolution is still with us. We are better off as a country uh, with the leadership that understands our revolution and its objectives than with a leadership which may be, in fact, at odds with the objectives of that revolution. But I, I come back to the inevitability of, of aging and succession. I mean, the fact is that Robert Mugabe, an immense figure in this country and across Africa, is 91 years old. And it is quite clear that in the politics of Zimbabwe today, there is a real focus on what next, the succession. And it seems to me it is beginning to destabilize politics in this country. Well, that proposition would make sense if uh, you were not looking at it against the background of uh, a very recent election. Hardly 20 or so months ago, we had a general election and it was up to the people of Zimbabwe to address precisely that question. And it is common cause that in overwhelming numbers, they addressed that question in favor of President Mugabe which means that as far as the Zimbabwean people are concerned, it is about having a leader who has the wisdom to understand precisely the sort of challenges that our country faces today. No, I take Rather than having a, 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 a leader who may be young, uh, but foolish. You know, it's barely, what, five or six months since one of the vice presidents of this country, Joyce Majuru, was unceremoniously removed from office with the wife of the president saying that she was plotting to kill both the president and herself, Grace Mugabe, and that to quote Grace Mugabe, dogs and fleas would not disturb her carcass. That is instability, is it not? No, uh, that is political banter. And Zimbabwe has human beings who engage well, in politics. When you in accuse politics. the vice president of trying to kill the president, that's not banter. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is this is uh, a, 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 a statement coming from the run-up to our Congress. And uh, uh, it is a fact that there were quite some serious allegations which were not uh, created by the First Lady but they were all over the place in the body politic. And it was very important to have a courageous person in the form of uh, the First Lady, Dr. Mugabe, to speak w w with uh, to respect, that issue. Uh, and, and this is Joyce Majuru's view on this. Not one shred of evidence was produced to back the claims made by Grace Mugabe. Joyce Majuru said, 
a vociferous attempt has been made to portray me as a traitor, a murderer, and a sellout, and there is not one iota of evidence to give any credibility to these allegations. What we see is vicious infighting now inside ZANU-PF, the ruling party. No, you saw a, a very spirited run-up to the Congress, which uh, the ruling party holds uh, every five years. And it was very important that all the issues uh, play out uh, in, in, in the open. And when that happens, it's more evidence of uh, a democracy at work rather than uh, the allegation of uh, instability. Here. Let us talk a little bit about Emerson Munungagwa. He is now the heir apparent. After the That's Joyce your view. Don't state it as well, a Well, he's fact. the vice president of the country. That's not a, my he view. He is a, a vice president of the country, one of the two, appointed by the president to assist him to implement the president's agenda related to his pledges to the electorate. After Joyce Majuru uh, no, 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 no. was fired, I want was politically I, I obliterated, I want to explain Emerson this. Munungagwa, by all accounts across this country, is seen as the man who will be the you next president. You can ask those who see him that way. But do you, not, do you not see him that way? He is uh, an appointed vice president. The president did not appoint him so that he could uh, succeed him. He appointed him so that he could assist him to implement the government of the, the policy program of the government. Do you think that a man, and this is Mr. Munungagwa, who will always be associated with the massive abuse of human rights in the military campaign of the early 1980s, which saw between 10 and 20,000 uh, Ndebele people killed in Matabili land, do you think he is the right man to take Zimbabwe forward in the 21st century? Look, uh, it's a straw man you are setting up and you are making a lot of assumptions without uh, any uh, evidence to support them. I repeat, he has been appointed to assist the president. As for these associations you are alleging, this is the stuff that uh, you find in the newspapers. He <laughs> it's not he just in the newspapers, well it's in the US know. State Department, it's in a, a whole series of human rights reports from international organizations. We know, for example, that during this campaign, Mr. Munungagwa, he said that he would shorten the stay on earth of any cockroaches who opposed Mr. Mugabe. This now the man who is talked of as Zimbabwe's next president. I just wonder if that is healthy. Uh, the, the, I want to repeat this reference uh, to him as the next president is yours. And it's a burden that uh, you should unravel for yourself and not state as a fact. However, it is also a fact we know as a Zimbabweans that between 1980 and 1987, we went through a very dark period and a lot of things were done and said by elements of the political leadership, including Emerson Mnangagwa, I mean, which, if, if which, I which are personal, totally and unacceptable. Forgive me for getting personal, but I believe you lost family members in that military campaign. Yes, I did. And I just wonder whether you personally, given your history, could countenance a man so closely associated with the mass killings becoming the next president of your country? What I can tell you is that before uh, he departed, the late former Vice President Joshua Nkomo, who was much more involved with these issues we are raising than yourself or anyone else uh, who makes reference to them, entered into a unity accord which addressed those issues. And we have learned from that unity accord that it is far better to build bridges than to harbor grudges. It's not uh, wise in politics to carry grudges with you. Just a final point on the leadership issue, and then I want to move on to substantive policy areas. But on the leadership issue, late last year, I've already mentioned her, but she became very significant in political terms. That is the wife of the president, Grace Mugabe. She became the leader of the women's movement inside ZANU-PF many people began to see her as a potential future leader of the country. And yet, in recent weeks and months, she's played a very low profile. Is Grace Mugabe, in your view, as one of the most senior figures in ZANU-PF, a future potential leader of this country? First of all, it's a fact that she's a leader today, not in future. The position of uh, Secretary for Women's uh, League or Affairs, 
is a leadership position in the ruling party and a senior uh, position at that. But if you are asking me, is she a future president or some such thing, then of course you must know that uh, it is always the people who decide that. Let's talk about um, different challenging policy areas for this government. One is human rights. You know, because you've been information minister at various points over the last 14, 15 years, that this government, ZANU-PF government, has been accused consistently of abusing human rights. Now, in recent years, there appears to have been some recognition in the international community that the record has improved somewhat. But only in recent days, we have seen another prominent anti-government activist and campaigner, uh, Itai Duzamara, disappear. You mean Zamara? Zamara. Yes. Disappear. He was walking yes, close yes. to his home. He was abducted. He has not been seen for more than 50 days. Yes, that's who very, took him? That's very sad. And uh, uh, whoever took him, and we don't know who took him, perhaps uh, only those who took him and God know where he is. But uh, the fact that uh, one person disappears is obviously of concern to the government. And we have made uh, our position as government very clear. However, people disappear every day. You are mentioning one person, but in fact, uh, we have quite some porous borders. A lot of people cross the border without uh, our knowing. This is knowing. a man who is staging a sit-in strike against the Mugabe Indeed. government, who demanded that the president Indeed. resign. Indeed. And Indeed. you're telling me that it's just coincidental he's disappeared and he may have run off across Indeed. the border. Indeed. I mean, we know only too well here in Zimbabwe, for example, that in the UK, people are disappearing every day. Some would have been making public statements against the government there. They disappear across the borders, many borders, and end up in Syria with y the British government not knowing. This now represents, this case of Mr. Zamara, it represents another dark cloud hanging over your relationship with those countries, including the United States and the European Union, who currently impose sanctions upon your government because of your long record of abusing human rights. This is another problem you've got. Well, if, if uh, uh, we do not hold the American government accountable to the very worrying loss of black lives in the United States at the hands of the police. Just right now, there is a case going on in Baltimore uh, involving uh, a Mr. Gray and some six police And the officers. U.S. authorities we are held to account for that, just, just as I'm like trying to hold you to account. That, just like we are doing that. And we don't do it in a manner that spoils no more diplomatic relations. We do it in a manner that recognizes the mutual responsibilities that states have under mm. international law. All right, let's talk about a different aspect of accountability then. Would you accept that your government must accept responsibility for 15 years of disastrous economic mismanagement? You know what? It is common cause known to everyone around the world that the period we are talking about so unprecedented, an unprecedented onslaught against this country. And the British government and its allies imposed sanctions seeking to damage the economy in the hope of causing mass disaffection against the government. You know, they no, wanted no. a failed state in Zimbabwe. But as we sit today, against the background of that 15-year mm. period, Zimbabwe is not a failed state. They wanted the president to fail. The president is not a failed leader. It's an economically we failed state. No, it's 72 percent of Zimbabweans living below the poverty line, according to the World Food Program. 80 percent of people without regular employment. More than 80 percent of people destined to work only in the informal sector. Uh, let me show you this newspaper. This is today's newspaper. Zimbabwe reduced to a nation of vendors. This is well, what your government has <laughs> delivered. You, you've picked a, a well-known opposition newspaper. I can do that in Britain, in America, anywhere in the world. There are, uh, there's no shortage of the lunatic fringe press in those countries. But let me tell you well, what. I, I don't need to read the newspaper well, to see that the, the economy done. in Harare. You, no, I know, but it, reading, look, it simply confirms what I see with my own Stephen, eyes. You go outside this posh hotel Stephen, and you, you see that in Harare, two points. people are making a living subsisting two in the illegitimate informal economy. Two it's the only way to survive. Two points. You've just picked uh, a newspaper and not an economic report. Secondly, 
You've just been here 24 hours and we are posing as an ex expert on our economy, which is the problem with uh, 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 people like you. You do not respect the, that a country has structures, a country has uh, history. You have been here and you've seen vendors, but we have farmers here, you have not seen them. We're doing wonderful but, but with respect, uh, I, I don't pose as an economist, but I read the data that economists produce. Well, Agricultural but production but but today compared with 30 years ago in Zimbabwe is drastically down. Is other data, other data. Is the opposite. More the, the, more the people may I, may I just like finish my point? More yeah. One more piece of data. More than 80% of government revenues in this country today go on paying public sector wages. That is not sustainable. No, you know what, uh, excuse me. Uh, the data, that the last two one we are pointing out, uh, the fact that 82% uh, of the budget goes to the wage bill is our data. This is the data we as government through our Minister of Finance, we have put on the table to say we need to do something about uh, the public service. And in general, we, we need to do something about a budget that is a, a consumer uh, budget in order to be able to fund infrastructure projects. But we are doing this against the background of uh, a sanction regime that was uh, 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 imposed by the British government and its allies and cost this country, this economy, $50 billion. How do you this work that better. out? I mean, mm. Zimbabweans, billion Zimbabweans dollars, it seems to me, are being asked to believe by your government that the ec economic disaster they're living through is all the fault of sanctions, when today the, no, re the reality is that EU sanctions are simply targeted against two individuals, Robert and Grace Mugabe. Well, How can they be destroying the this entire this economy? Is, this is a reality which is hardly 12 months out of a period of 15 years within which your, uh, the, the British government and its allies systematically sought regime change here in ways that have no example anywhere uh, uh, on our continent. You rejected my proposition that you've, your government has had a disastrous uh, economic record over the last 15 years, rejected that. So why do you think in recent years up to one and a half million Zimbabwe's have voted with their feet and left this country, most of them to go and try and find work in South Africa. Why do you think they've done that? We, we do not uh, deny that uh, the last 15 or so years, um, bar one or two last uh, uh, years, have uh, seen quite uh, some structural dislocation in our country. And You've uh, lost more than 10% of your population. Yes, but, uh, but you know what? That is the bad news. The good news is that many of them are coming back. Many of those are coming back. They are beginning to find opportunities here. And some of them are, are, are experiencing horrible conditions uh, uh, in some countries, most recently in South Africa, where they were subjected to xenophobic well, attacks. I, I, I've just been in South Africa for a number of days, and I've actually spoken to a lot of Zimbabweans. And despite the xenophobic attacks that you refer to, they say to a man and woman, to me, they want to stay in South Africa because in South Africa they can get work, they can make some money, they can send some money to their families in a way that is absolutely impossible for them in today's Zimbabwe. It is their right to be wherever they are. We, we have millions of Britons outside the United Kingdom and you will not have Zimbabwe becoming the first country that will keep all its citizens. There are reasons why people want to be where they are. But President Zuma, it was interesting, after the violence, the violence we saw in, in and around Durban and Johannesburg directed at African migrant workers, some of whom were Zimbabwean, uh, Jacob Zuma, he said, look, we condemn this. This is terrible. This is not the South Africa we want to be. But he also said our neighboring countries have their own responsibility to deliver economic and political conditions which will mean their people will not need or want to leave home. Our brothers and sisters, he said, in neighboring countries, must be in a situation where they no longer need to leave their countries in search of a better life. That means there's a responsibility on you. Look, there is the, the primary responsibility for any government, ours included, is the protection of its citizens and the, the livelihood of its citizens. But you cannot, uh, in one and the same breath, say there have been these horrible attacks but uh, uh, you don't uh, 
condone them. However, why are people here and not uh, in their countries? That is precisely what xenophobia is. If we're talking about uh, no, uh, no, South it's Africans, not. That, that's it, not xenophobic. That's it's what it is. That's the, why that's is that the, xenophobic? Because you are actually saying, don't come here, stay in your own no, country. No, he's just, he's just saying to countries like yours that there is a great need for reform, for change, so that Zimbabweans can live in he's peace and prosperity in their own country. You know, we are exporting a lot of jobs to, to, to South Africa. The South African economy is what it is. First, historically, because of uh, cheap labor from uh, countries such as ours. You have used some extraordinarily inflammatory language about the South Africans. You have said, quote, xenophobia today in South Africa can easily mutate into genocide tomorrow. You've accused South that Africa, accused South Africa of Afrophobia. What is your problem with South Africa? No, I've, uh, actually, you know, we don't have any problems with South Africans. In fact, we also don't have any well, problem. To, to use the word genocide, <laughs> we, uh, to use the word did genocide, you, did you as not, you did. You asked the question, isn't it? I want to repeat, we have no problems with South Africa or South Africans. They are our comrades, our brothers, and our sisters. We're in the trenches together. But we have serious problems with those lynch mobs doing what they did in full view of television cameras. So does Jacob if you Zuma. Allow, if you but allow to that to happen, without condemning it outright, without condemning it unconditionally, you sow seeds of genocide. This is a fact. Uh, if you have a king who is very influential, saying that uh, foreigners must pack their bags go, uh, and go, uh, and uh, uh, likening them to lice and ants, that is what happened. It's similar to what happened in... Do you in, think in anybody in South Africa is to prepared to take lectures from a representative of the Mugabe government when it comes to uh, allegations of violence, of, of extraordinary repression of people, including people of a different ethnicity inside their own country? Is Zimbabwe in any position at all to take moral high ground on this sort of issue? It is not about taking moral high ground. It is about defending our, our people. I, myself, as Jonathan Moyo, come from a constituency in Cholocho that was profoundly affected by what was happening in South Africa. I have a responsibility to represent that uh, constituency, and I do so without fear or favor and uh, without owing anyone an apology. A final thought. We've talked a lot about the political situation here, we've talked about the economic situation, and we've talked about the fact that there is going to be, before too long, a transition. Are you confident in the circumstances of today's Zimbabwe that the transition, when it comes, is going to be peaceful and stable? Well, look, I don't know what transition you're talking about. Well, of course uh, you uh, do. Uh, no, I don't. This country has been dominated by one man for no, 35 but that's, years, that's one man and that will soon come to an end. It is just nature. Look, it's not like we are a monarchy like you. You know, uh, getting into power here is not by inheritance. It is by election. It's the people. We would be feeling uh, some pressure if we did not have the constitutional means for acquiring power in this country. Power in this country is acquired through a democratic election. And when you have those means in place, honestly, it, it boggles the mind as to why anyone would suggest that uh, there's something we somehow should worry about uh, 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 facing us in the near future. Jonathan Moyo, we have to end there, but thank you for being on Hard Talk. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure.